Welcome to the Bayside Message of the Week. Today we have a message from Pastor Rob. If you have a story on how God is working in your life, send us an email to stories at baysidechurch.com.au. If you're in the Melbourne area, why not come join us at our Cheltenham or Frankston campus and see how church has changed. Check it out. I'm going to share God's Word with you right now on the tangible kingdom. The message notes are on the website, baysidechurch.com.au. And uh, you can just click on uh, weekly message and it will bring them up for you there. Um, We're going to bring the, um, you can take your own notes as well. We're going to bring the text up on the screen if we can do that right now. 1 Corinthians 10.33 and uh, and it's from the amplified version of the Bible. So 1 Corinthians 10.33, the amplified version. Just as I myself strive to please, to accommodate myself to the opinions, desires, and interests of others, adapting myself in everything I do, not aiming at or considering my own profit or advantage, but that of the many in order that they may be saved. I love the way that the Amplified uh, amplifies that verse. Oh, that's why it's called the Amplified. It's amazing how you can learn as you teach. Just as I myself strive to please, to accommodate myself to the opinions, desires, and interests of others. That's what the word please means right there. And then he talks about adapting himself in everything he does, and everything he do, does, <laughs> in everything he does. This is going to be a great message. Not aiming at or considering my own profit or advantage, but that of the many in order that they might be saved. We're going to unpack this verse just for a few minutes. And I want you to notice, first of all, what the apostle says there, that that in living tangibly, he doesn't aim at or consider his own profit or his own advantage. In other words, living tangibly sometimes means giving up what we would rather do or be. He wasn't aiming at or considering his own profit or advantage. His goal was to bring people into relationship with God through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Last week, I was talking about the ministry and the message of reconciliation and how sometimes we get a wrong understanding of what reconciliation is all about. We defines it for us in, the, in 2 Corinthians 5 that I shared last week that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. And we've got to understand that as biblical reconciliation because sometimes we, we want to be involved in reconciliation, even on a human level, but we, we get involved in a thing that I will call conditional reconciliation. Conditional reconciliation says a couple of things. It it says, um, I'm right and you're wrong. And we'll reconcile as long as you realise that. Or my view is better than your view. And we can reconcile as long as you agree with me. My view is better than yours. In other words, if I can give you enough information or evidence or research, you will come over to my side. The ideal situation in conditional reconciliation is that you will agree with me and then we will be reconciled. And many times as Christians, we engage in this kind of reconciliation, but it's not fully biblical, that kind of reconciliation. Let me give you a definition for biblical reconciliation. It's a process, not just an outcome. And that's really important because Um, I I preached a message last year called Steadfast in Direction, where we looked at uh, people that are on a journey toward God and how it's important that we recognise where someone is at on the journey before we uh, give them a presentation of the gospel. Sometimes the best witness is silence, not saying anything at all. Sometimes it's speaking, but we need to be sensitive. Biblical reconciliation is a process, not just an outcome. Jesus engaged with people as the constant pursuer of that which is disconnected. As you read the Gospels, think about that. 
Jesus was constantly pursuing people who were disconnected from God. And, and we find Jesus in the most unlikely places. Jesus would hang out with people and go to places where the religious would never go. And, and they judged him for it. They said, he's a glutton and a drunkard. And let me say, Jesus was neither. But he got labelled with that because of his associations with people. But he was trying to recognise the people were that were loved by God, they were disconnected from God and he wanted to bring them on a journey back to God. And should, should we not imitate him? Let me give you a couple of scriptures that illustrate biblical reconciliation. If you're taking notes, write down Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, first of all. And I want you to notice this, what the Apostle Paul says here. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more. Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? I want you to notice that there, church. This is so important. When were we reconciled to God? When we got it all together. When we finally cleaned up our lives. When we started going to church. When we were good people. We were reconciled to God while we were still his enemies. That's what it says right there. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. That is biblical reconciliation. And it saddens me that sometimes the church engages in conditional reconciliation that says, when you get your act together, when you get your life right, when you stop doing this, when you start doing that, that's, that's conditional reconciliation. If God had waited for us to get right, we'd never be made right. Because we were made right by what his son did, not by what we did. That's right. Right. Glad we've made that point. Go over to Colossians chapter 1 with me, if you would, please, in your Bibles. Colossians chapter 1. I want to read a few verses. I was just saying, we had, I had my men's team around on Thursday night for dinner and uh, chatting about next year and all of that. And while we were talking, I said, you know, I miss the days when people would bring their Bibles to church. There was a time when I said, turn in your Bibles, that we would have rustling and I miss Russell. Can we bring Russell back? Yeah. yeah? You know, these days people are flicking through their iPhones or their iPads or whatever, and it's silent. I want... That's it. Let's do that. Let's make that our theme for 2015. <laughs> bring back Russell. Yeah. Paper, retro, it's cool now. Book, <laughs> fully charged, never goes flat, never dumps anything, always there. Boot off, boot on, boot off, boot on. Isn't that amazing? Book. Colossians chapter one, verse 19. Where's the little 19? <laughs> oh, that's it. Okay. There it is. There it is. Time to get new glasses. Four, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. That's in Jesus. So Jesus was, was uh, the fullness of God in a human body. Uh, verse 20, and through him, through Jesus, to reconcile to himself, uh, just a few things. Oh, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That's talking about what I spoke about last week. When, when, um, when God was reconciling, he was reconciling the world to himself. Now, I'm not speaking about universalism here. 
I'm not talking about automatic salvation because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Uh, We still need to come to a point where we personally accept and receive. To as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be the sons and daughters of God. Amen? So this is not universalism, but what is understanding is that on the cross, the whole world was reconciled potentially. In other words, when Jesus died and rose again, it was enough for everybody, enough for everyone by his blood shed on the cross. Verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation, Then note there in verse 23, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out by the gospel. And so this is not a a once saved, always saved, an easy believism uh, or, or anything like that. It is coming to faith in Christ and then continuing in faith in Jesus Christ for the rest of our lives. That's what Colossians 2 and verse 6 says. If you just flip over there to the next page. Uh, Chapter 2 and verse 6. It was subtle, wasn't it? Thank you, Russell. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. Continue to live in him. This is not just about making a decision for Jesus and then walking away. This is about making a decision, accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and then walking with him for the rest of your life, and then walking into eternity with him. So see to it uh, that uh, just as you receive Christ, Jesus as Lord, that you continue in him. Let's go back to our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I I actually forgot to mention to you that I'm looking at two principles here on how to share your faith. So principle number one, uh, if you haven't written it down, it might have been on the screen. Principle number one is to be respectful of the opinions of others. Be respectful of the opinions of others. Of others. That's what Paul is saying here. Just as I myself strive to please, to accommodate myself to the opinions, desires, and interests of others. In other words, this is about uh, listening to people, not just speaking at people. Old time evangelism was just going out and finding how many people you could get to talk to about Jesus. What the Bible is speaking about here is actually developing relationship with people because they're a person loved by God and not a love with hooks. In other words, I will love you as long as eventually you come to Jesus. And if you don't come to Jesus in my time frame, then we won't continue to be friends. That's not biblical. And so here he's talking about um, the uh, showing interest, he says, accommodating myself to the opinions, desires, and interests of other people. How will you ever find out about other people unless you're involved with other people? How will you ever find out about what other people are interested in and what their opinions are unless you listen to them? I think sometimes listening is a bit of a dying art. I find a lot of people these days want to speak. And, and they're happy as long as they're talking. And they're happy as long as you're asking them questions about them. Uh, but as soon as you start to say something, they, the glassy thing happens. Have you noticed that? The cla- and you know they're orbiting another planet while you're speaking. Uh, but we should be able to be good listeners and be interested in the lives of other people Listening to their opinions, even if you disagree with the opinion, listen and then ask them questions about why they have that opinion. Listen about their desires. Show interest in what interests them. It's about finding common ground with other people. And we've all got common ground. They might not be a Christian, we're Christian. So we have that indifference, but we have lots of other things in common. Most of us have a mortgage. Most have uh, married people and some others have kids. Or if you're married, you can, married, you can talk about marriage. If you work, you can talk about work. If you're single, 
You have something in common with other people. Your hobbies, your sport interests, your books that you've been reading, fitness, movies, find common ground with people. Be interested in what interests them. We find this all the way through the Bible. God found common ground all the way through the Bible with people. We're coming up to Christmas. One of my favorite stories is of the Magi, the the astronomers or astrologers. We're really not sure what they were. But one thing we knew, that that they were fascinated with, with stars. So how would God speak to people who were fascinated about stars? What would he do to show an interest in common ground with people who are interested in stars? To lead them to Jesus. (laughs) Maybe a star. Oh, what a good idea. Jesus did the same all the way through the Gospels. He found common ground with people. He told stories that people could relate to. He talked about Farmers and fishermen and housewives and business people. And he told stories about people uh, that people could engage with. And he took them from what they knew and took them on a journey to what they didn't know. And we would do the well, well to do the same. And so first of all, be respectful of the opinions of others. And secondly and finally, be ready when others ask about your faith. Be ready. When others ask about your faith. In Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt. The word seasoned there means spiced or stimulating. Let your conversation be stimulating so that you may know how to answer everyone. Amazing. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 13. Listen before you answer. If you don't, you are being stupid and insulting. Please, God, could you be more clear? 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and Respect. I want you to notice three things from that verse. First of all, others' job, the job of other people is to ask. So when we go into a a discussion with someone or we're, we're spending time with people, the initiation for spiritual conversation should come from the other person. So there's no room for Bible bashing right here. They take the initiative. Our job is to be prepared Our job is to make sure we're doing our homework, as it were, studying the Word of God so that we have answers for when people ask us why we have this hope in Jesus. And then thirdly, I want you to notice our attitude. It says, do this with gentleness and respect. Wow. I haven't always done that. What about you? I remember times, especially when I first became a Christian, when I wasn't very gentle. Sometimes it worked, but sometimes I turned people away, including my whole family for a while. Gentleness and respect. Now, this, these two verses assume that we have relationship and contact with the people that the Bible calls outsiders. And it's not a very nice term, really, but, it, but the Bible uses it, and it talks about those who are not Christians yet, calls them outsiders, they're outside the church. But it assumes here that we actually know people like that and that we actually have contact with people who are not Christians yet and that we actually develop relationship with people who are not Christians yet. And I think it's sad when you see people that have been Christians for a long, long period of time and their entire world revolves around Christianity, around church and around Christian friends. And they lose contact with a world that God loves and Jesus died for. If that describes you, you might want to make a note of a New Year's resolution to get involved with people who don't know Jesus. Last week, uh, we had a man here from Rotary, uh, heads up the Bentley Moorabbin Rotary Club, and uh, Lisa Kinross uh, was with him. They have donated $4,500 toward our Christmas lunch, the local Rotary, which I think is stunning, don't you? Isn't that wonderful? That was last Saturday night. 
And, uh, you know, I was talking to Lisa. Lisa and Brett have been part of Bayside for many years. And uh, Lisa said to me, she said, the reason, she said, I was looking for something to do. And she said, I had a choice with the time that I've got either to get involved in something that Bayside is doing or get involved in a community group. And she said, I decided to get involved in a community group and she's on, she's part of Rotary locally. I think that's wonderful. And I'm not saying we're always looking for people to help out with what we're doing here at Bayside, but, but you might want to consider as well being involved in something in your local community. How else are you going to get to know people who don't know Jesus yet, but he loves them? So, so important. I was talking to Gigi last night, my, uh, our eldest daughter, uh, I was bringing her to the youth group last night, and we were just chatting um, about the party she went to last Saturday evening. And, uh, of course, you know, having kids, um, they have school friends and parties and all sorts of things on. But one of the things that we have agreed on as a family is that, as a family, we gather with the believers of Bayside on a Saturday night. So our three kids come. Christy, normally, she's in Bali with the team until tomorrow. But we come here on a Saturday night, all five of us. And that includes the nights when they have a party on. And they love that just as much as we love that. That's just, that's just part of our DNA as a family. We think that the gathering of the believers is important enough to make it a number one priority here on a Saturday night. And it's not just because I'm the pastor. If I wasn't the pastor, I'd be here anyway. Because I've always done that ever since I became a Christian. And so Gigi came here and she brought a friend with her uh, who absolutely loved church and then afterwards, I gave them a lift to the party. It was down in Lang Warren. And, um, and so we had half an hour in the car and uh, dropped them off. And they had a bonfire there. And there's about 20 uh, teenagers standing around the bonfire. And they had a wonderful night. And then Gigi and I were talking as we were coming to uh, youth last night. And uh, she said, you know, I'm just so glad um, I come to church on a Saturday night. She said, it was great going to the party afterwards. And all the people there said, how come you're late? And she said, I've been to church. And uh, she said, she opened up all these amazing conversations with her friends. She said, even some of her friends who are not Christian and they don't believe in God, she said, one of the friends said, oh, I wish I, I was a Christian. I wish I had something to believe in as well. And then I wouldn't be so cynical in life. I said, well, bring him to church. You can become one too. And so I just love that. There she is with a, you know, she's not going in there with a Bible or anything going, well, I just went to church and you're a bunch of sinners and you need to repent or anything. She's just there. And, and a natural conversation came up and there was no Bible bashing or anything, but she, she led two or three of her friends a little bit closer to Jesus. Tangible kingdom. Let me finish up with five bullet points. I'm just going to mention these really, really quickly. These are just things to think of as you live tangibly. Number one, if you don't know the answer to a question that you're asked, be honest. Say, I don't know. Don't find yourself fluffing through some sort of pathetic answer to a question that you don't even believe the answer to. But, but find out. Say, oh, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that, but let me find out for you. Number two, when the conversation is over, it's over. Number three, there's a little bit of John Cleese slipping around here. <laughs> Don't be judgmental or critical of the beliefs of others. Don't be judgmental or critical of the beliefs of others. Share truth rather than correct error. Number four, ask questions to answer questions like Jesus did. Jesus did that all the time. People would ask him a question and he would ask a question in answer of the question. That's a really good way to communicate because invariably you actually draw the answer out of the other person. And we all know if we come up with the answer ourselves, it is a much better answer than you could have given us. Number five, do not be discouraged when people don't respond to the gospel straight away. Lots of things happen that lead people on a journey towards Jesus and some seeds that you sow, you will never see bloom this side of heaven. So do not be discouraged discouraged. I want to finish up with a really quick story. I'm sorry I've gone a little bit over time. The worship team, you can come um, and we'll finish up with that new song that we sang tonight, which is stunning. A number of years ago, I was working in Western Australia and uh, on the radio in Geraldton and my family live in Perth. And so I would go down to Perth on a regular basis and spend the weekend with them and then 
drive back to Geraldton. And Geraldton is 400 kilometres north of Perth. On the coast, it's a straight road and, uh, and a boring road. There's a lot of nothing. We can just have that a little bit quieter. Thanks, Rohan. Um, and uh, so on this particular occasion, I decided to, to take the coastal road. It was a little bit further, but it was a bit more pleasant. So I drove the coastal road and right out in the middle of nowhere, if anyone here is from WA or have been to WA, it was near a place called Lancelin. And uh, yeah, ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, so you know, it's pretty flat and it's pretty deserted and there's a lot of nothing around Lancelin. So right in the middle of nowhere, there was this T intersection and I had to turn right. And right there, this guy was standing with his backpack and he was hitchhiking. And so I picked him up and he got in the car. And so we had about four, four and a half hours to talk. And he told me his story of how he was from Bulgaria. And this is back in the days when Bulgaria was one of the strictest communist countries in the world. And uh, he got out of Bulgaria. And I said, why did, you, why did you leave? He said, I wanted to leave because they told me that I wasn't allowed to believe in God. So he said, I wanted to get out. I was, I was tired of the, uh, of the oppression and, and them telling us what we could and couldn't do. And uh, he told me the story of how he'd got to Sydney and someone in Sydney had given him a, a Bulgarian Bible and, uh, and he'd been reading it. And he'd hitchhiked across from Sydney, across the Nullarbor uh, to Perth and he was going up the West Coast now and, and of course this is where I picked him up. And uh, he got to the point in the Bible when I picked him up, he got up to John chapter 3. And uh, I said, how are you going with that? And he said, oh... Not great. He said, I don't understand all this stuff about born again. What does born again mean? And so he asked me that question. And we talked about what born again meant and what, and what Jesus has done for us on the cross and everything. And we got up to Geraldton and I uh, said, have you got anywhere to stay? And he said, no. And I said, I was living with a few guys from the church. And so invited him around to our home and we had dinner together. And that evening, myself and my mates from church we led him to faith in Jesus Christ. It was wonderful. It was like the Ethiopian eunuch story, but it's the Bulgarian guy. And uh, next day we had breakfast and then he was going to continue to hitchhike north. And so I dropped him out on the road, said goodbye. Never seen him again. Never heard from him. Uh, completely lost contact. This is, my goodness, when would this be? Early 80s. So what's that, 30 years ago-ish? Who but knows where he is and what he's doing right now? God does. Am I discouraged? No. Because it's all part of just, you know, God put him there and put it on my heart to drive on a road that I don't usually drive on, to go there, to pick him up, to explain the gospel, to lead him to Jesus, to drop him off on a road, and he's gone. I don't know what he's doing. Maybe he's pastoring a church somewhere. Maybe went back to Bulgaria. I don't know. God knows. But it was wonderful to be a part of that journey. And can I encourage you, as men and women of faith in Jesus, be part of the journey in people's lives. Amen. Be sensitive to their opinions and interests and always be ready to give them an answer. Let's pray together.